we'll be hearing all about a new rock revealing the hidden gems of Manchester. And with Mockingjay firing up a storm at the box office, we'll catch up with our film critic Tom to see what he has to say. and welcome to Keys News. I'm Amber Hack. And I'm Lewis Smith. We start with Facebook. It's in the headlines for being called a safe haven for terrorists to share extremist views. The site closed down accounts from one of Lee Rigby's killers. He'd sent messages about killing soldiers. Fusilier Rigby's stepfather said, Facebook failed us all when they failed to alert the authorities. The social media giant has responded to the report by announcing a change in privacy policy giving users the ability to control their information. The update will be Im implemented on January the 1st. Our reporter Andrew Crompton took to the streets to ask people if Facebook should monitor its users and report suspicious behaviour to the police. Did Facebook really know that Lee Rigby was going to get attacked? Did Facebook really have the appropriate privacy rules to give out all of that information? So, in my opinion, I think there's not much that could have been done, even if they did know, because they didn't know who, the, who they were going to attack in the first place. I think Facebook has an, really does have an obligation as the administrator and the owner of the site to make sure that there are no, um, there's no radicalisation going on, there are no threats to other people. Um, I've had troll messages from people that I don't know, and I don't think that um, Facebook does enough to quite protect people. Information is just always broadcast and it's always available to everyone that's on, on the social media site using it. So yeah, I think so. Maybe there's got to be some way of limiting the information that can be passed to certain groups of individuals who it might scare or harm in some other way. It had a moral obligation over that particular incident, Lee Rigby, yes. They should have, they should have alerted the authorities. Should. Watchdogs have identified areas of improvement for the Christie Hospital. Monitor and Care Quality Commission say the cancer specialist should consider changes to improve engagement with non-medical staff. Their report encourages what it calls open learning to be achieved by better communication and trust between staff. Waiting time in outpatient care has also been flagged up. Now for those of you looking for a bite to eat and an alternative Christmas gift, Manchester's Christmas markets have kicked off this year's celebrations. New figures estimate that more than half a million people have paid a visit to the stalls since its opening two weeks ago. Now the markets have scored a top five on food hygiene ratings. Our reporter Katie Williams went along to see how they've reached that achievement. Here I am in Manchester where everyone is visiting the markets and feeling festive, getting their mulled wine and their crepes. The best of all is every market stall has got themselves a five in their hygiene rating. All 114 Christmas market stalls got the highest possible rating after inspection by Manchester City Council. I caught up with two stall holders to find out how they keep their stalls spick and span. All the samples get rotated every hour, so it all stays in the low 5 Celsius. So that way nobody's getting any cross-contamination, nobody's going to be ill. So that's why we always get a 5, as you can see through our history, all our procedures that we have to do. So we have a manual that we stick to, otherwise we get our P45. How do you feel that your stall has got a 5 hygiene rating? I feel pretty proud, yeah, it's good to Manchester, it's good business. To ensure the stall's high ratings, food waste must be kept to a minimum. I spoke to one Christmas shopper who welcomes this news. I think it's great, eh? it attracts a lot of business, uh, it keeps the place nice and clean and tidy, so it's a great thing. It is not even December yet, and the markets have attracted over half a million people. So get yourself down this upcoming festive season for some good, clean fun. Katie Williams, reporting for Keys TV News. Manchester retailers brace themselves for this year's Black Friday Super Sale. Expect shoppers to be in the scramble for bargains tomorrow, queuing from the early hours at the Trafford Centre, the Arndale and many other retailers. Cut price TV, smartphones and gaming consoles are at the top of shoppers' Christmas lists. Chaotic scenes are expected. In the US, there were stabbings last year in the queues at Walmart. Tweet us at Keys News and let us know what bargains you'll be looking to get tomorrow. Now Manchester City Camp Council is clamping down on littering and litter bugs could now face spot fines or prosecution. Lucy Tye reports. 
It is a problem that is sweeping the nation and some areas are worse than others. Manchester has been clamping down on littering in the city centre. Did you know that you could be fined between £75 and £2,000 for dropping a packet of crisps on the floor? The move is part of a huge litter crackdown organised by Manchester City in response to concerns from residents about the problem. A dedicated team of officers will work seven days a week looking out for the people who ignore rubbish bins and drop their litter on the ground. Lucy Ty, Keys News. Well, now I'm here with our in-house film buff, Tom, who's been to see the new Hunger Games film this week. So, Tom, did Mocking Jay leave you hungry for more? Well, it's, let me tell you now, Amber, after watching the fever dream that was Nativity 3, Dude, Where's My Donkey? I could have watched paint dry and I still would have got a more positive review than, than, than <laughs> the Nativity. However, no, this was a brilliant film. Now, Tom, I've heard Jennifer Lawrence shook off some of those controversies she's caught herself up with with these performances. Did J-Law steal the show for you? Jennifer Lawrence plays a very vulnerable character in this, and her acting has always been brilliant. You know, she's an Oscar-winning actress, and in this, she plays a vulnerable, shattered person who's endured so much, but you genuinely believe that she's been through these experiences. I mean, all the performances are fantastic. They're spot on. Uh, Josh Hutchinson plays Peter, and he is heartbreakingly sympathetic. You watch him on camera, and I'm not going to lie, you're tearing up when you're watching him because he's giving such a powerful performance. But for me, Julie Julian Moore, who played President Coyne, she was the she was my favourite character. She plays this morally grey leader of a nation that's trying to rebel against the capital, and she's fantastic because all the way through you think, is she a goodie? Is she a baddie? You're never quite sure. And of course, the tribute to the late Philip Seymour Hoffman in the end. Well, yeah, this was Philip Seymour Hoffman's last role. He will, of course, appear in part two. However. It, he was spot on. He really. There's a lot of media in this, and you know we're in the media, and he he plays that focus group esque propagandist. You know, he sat there saying, "Oh well, she needs darker hair. You know, she needs. We need this. We need that." But there was one moment that I did find bizarre. At the very end of the film, it goes in loving memory of Philip Seymour Hoffman, <laughs> and then the music starts and it just goes hmm, <laughs> and it was like what. And if people laughed in the audience. That's how strange it was. Well, that all sounds very serene, but I have heard the film features some more violent scenes. Would you say it's suitable for kids? Um, well, the BBC have rated this 12A, which means you can take under 12s if they're accompanied by an adult. But blimey, Charlie, you've seen some horrific stuff in this film. I, I won't go into too much detail, but I'm talking burnt-out skeletons, civilians actively targeted. It isn't, it's a film that isn't afraid to shy away from the horror of war, and it's something that I loved about the film, because so often in cinema we see this this need to like present war as something glamorous and it's really not well I see you've got the pin there let's let's give it the Hunger Games tribute now two Manchester authors have unearthed cities hidden gems in their new book secret Manchester Gemma Crozier reports statue in the center of Manchester no, no. do you know who Archimedes is no I don't so did you know that we have an Archimedes statue in Manchester. No, I've never even heard of one. Never heard of it before. A new book has been released and it discovers all the hidden treasures of Manchester right around the corner from you. Today I met Archimedes, one of the 90 treasures mentioned in the book. I then went out to try and find a few more. First on our tour of Manchester's hidden gems was the Richmond Tea Rooms, a unique English style tea room that models its decor on the films of Tim Burton. The quirky tea rooms was brimming with happy customers, despite being just off the beaten path. I caught up with the authors of the book, Phil Pagedy and little childs and ask them some of their personal favourite gems on their list. Yeah, I think we've got a couple of favourites, haven't we? I mean, uh, I think a couple of my favourites, they're quite different actually. I learned a bit about Mark Addy, who was the guy who lived on the Irwell, and uh, the, the only trace of him now is that the pub's named after him at the bottom of Bridge Street near the People's Music and the Mark Addy pub. It's actually just into Salford, but he lived on the Manchester side. Uh, and in the 1800s, he used to live on the river near Blackfriars Bridge, and he was an amazing swimmer. And if anybody fell in the river, they would call for him, and he would jump in the river and, and save them. And for me, it was uh, being a scientist, uh, finding the Archimedes statue um, alongside Eumist, which, you know, is quite an apt place for it to be uh, housed. The locals then told me what they believed to be Manchester's hidden gem. Can you tell me what you think Manchester's biggest hidden gem is? Is the people, of course. The people of Manchester's here, the, the hidden gem of Manchester. I think really, basically, it's just the shopping. Shopping? Shopping, definitely. Especially this uh, time of the year. 
I think Manchester's hidden gem are the people um, and also uh, the weather. The weather. Gemma Crozzi reporting for Keys TV News. And now over to sport with Ben Hobson. Thanks, Lewis. Salford City drew 2 all with Warrington Town in the Evo Stick Division 1 North on Tuesday evening. I was at Moor Lane to watch. City were close to being beaten by one of their former players, Scott Metcalf, in their 2 all draw with FA Cup giant killers Warrington Town on Tuesday night. Salford came into the game at Moor Lane with Martin Andrews making his first home appearance after an injury spell. Salford took the lead 10 minutes into the first half through in-form striker Sam Maidley. He twisted and turned past three Warrington defenders before exquisitely slotting past goalkeeper Carl Wills. You are unlikely to see quicker feet in the league this season. ex ami Scott Metcalf came back to haunt Salford just after the half-hour mark. A brilliant clearing challenge unfortunately fell perfectly for him on the edge of the area to smash home the equaliser. The Reds were made to pay again, this time an error in midfield leading to Metcalf again being played through. As it looked like he'd been taking it slightly too wide, he brilliantly blasted the ball past the helpless Sam Guthrie into the far corner. The first half wasn't done for goals. Just as the referee was about to blow for half-time, the returning Martin Andrews slotted into an empty net following good work from Jamie Rother. Warrington had their chances to win the game late on, with Metcalf just missing his chance of a hat-trick hitting the bar. A brilliant goal-line clearance from midfielder Ash Dunn thwarted Warrington, who looked as if they were to snatch a win but it wasn't to be as Salford held on. In the end, a 2-2 draw was a fair result for both sides. Ben Hobson, Keys TV News. Salford are in action again at the weekend when they take on Bursco at Moor Lane. Elsewhere in their division, Droylsden host Prescott Cables and Mossley travel to Clitheroe. In the Northern Premier, FC United will be looking to bounce back with a win following their defeat to Starbridge when they travel to Stamford. In the Conference North, Stalybridge will be looking to build on their first win in 12 games when they travel to newly promoted Chorley. And in the Conference Premier, Chester face Nuneaton coming off the back of a win against Dartford in midweek. We'll be hoping for the Manchester teams to fare better than they did last weekend. Back to you, Lewis. Thank you, Ben. We'll indeed be hoping they will do better this week. Now let's see if any of the weekend game will be affected by the weather. Over to David Taylor, who's outside with the forecast. Thanks guys, well as you can see it's another dismal day here in Salford with lots of low cloud and light rain. The bad news is that rain is going to continue on and off until the end of the week and it's not really going to let up. The good news is these conditions are acting as kind of blanket over the city so uh, it's retaining any heat we do have. There's not going to be too many frosty mornings with minimum temperatures of 3 Celsius. However it will feel colder towards the end of the weekend, particularly Sunday. There's a low front coming in and there's going to be much stronger winds. Back to you guys. Thanks, David. Now, don't forget that as well as delivering live news coverage twice a week, you can also visit us online. Yes, that's right. Go to keysnews.net to find our latest reports, news and sports coverage. And you can also stay updated for our Facebook page where you can comment, like or share any of our stories that you see in today's programme or on our website. As well as Facebook, you can catch up with us on Twitter. A few of our viewers have tweeted us about Black Friday tomorrow. Luke Dudley tweeted... I'm going to do my shopping from the comfort of my flat to avoid the masses. And Molly's doing her Black Friday shopping online to escape the chaos. Whereas Tom is braving the Trafford Centre tomorrow and looking forward to it. So what do you reckon, Lewis? Do you think you'll be braving the masses tomorrow? <laughs> I probably won't. I'm a Christmas Eve shopper, me. I leave it all until the last minute. <laughs> I don't blame you, to be fair. I've had a look at some of the uh, discounts that they're planning to do and I think people are going to be there in the hundreds upon thousands. Yeah, I'll be uh, firmly at home, <laughs> enjoying the <laughs> I walk. don't blame you. So the Coca-Cola truck will be arriving at the Trapper Centre tomorrow from 1 o'clock. Do you reckon you'll go and see that? So I get, I'm a bit like a child around Christmas. I get really excited. And the Coca-Cola truck, the advert, the it's music, the it was the all song. part of the Christmas experience for me. But it's still November. It seems to be getting earlier every year that they bring this advert on and all the Christmas hype. So I will be going to see it, but I might leave it. That's all we have time for today. Don't forget to tune in next Tuesday at 1.30. Until then, goodbye.